Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Alligator Academy. Uh, welcome to today's Alligator Academy workshop. <clears throat> the Alligator Academy, which is the Applied Lifelong Learning and Information Gator Academy, is a series of workshops on important life skills that you may not have learned in school. We have many interesting workshops. Topics include uh, home organization, healthy living, healthy relationships, home repair, disaster preparedness, personal finance, an alumni panel, and mental health. And that's just this semester. Workshops are held every other Friday during the spring semester at 12 noon Eastern Standard Time. This presentation is being recorded. Today's topic is healthy relationships and we are joined by the presenter, Carissa Henry. So Carissa began her own educational journey at EGCC, uh, JCC at the time. After EGCC, she transferred to Ohio University Eastern and earned her bachelor's degree. She then went on to earn a master's degree and a doctoral degree in counseling. She put those degrees to work today as the TRIO Scholars Licensed Counselor. She says, quote, my job gives me the privilege to sit with students when they are anxious, stressed out, or experiencing relationship problems, or even just need motivation. I love what I do in helping students navigate life and ultimately earn a degree. I'll pass it over to um, Carissa. Okay, Asuka, you can still hear me, correct? Just give me a thumbs up, make sure. Yes, awesome. Awesome, great, okay. Um, hi, Caitlin, I see you're our, our only participant right now. Um, so this workshop is designed to be a little bit interactive. Um, so we can utilize the chat or if you feel comfortable unmuting, um, you can unmute at any time and participate. Um, and Asako and Abby, feel free to participate as well. Um, so Asako asked me to present a workshop on healthy relationships. I um, mean, you know, we're a little close to Valentine's Day here. Um, this information will come from from um, uh, the counseling field and from partnerships, marriages, but healthy relationships, they can, it can transfer to any relationship in your life. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. Okay. Okay, so today, um, my hope today is that we will discuss aspects that can build healthy relationships. We will discover ways um, that relationships can break down and we will learn skills to help make your own relationships flourish. Um, and that's kind of all going to be mixed together. It's not going to be a step-by-step -step process, but that's going to be mixed together. I'm going to break up our time together today by doing a few couple minute videos as well. Okay. All right. So tell me one word that comes to mind when I say healthy relationships. And since there's only one person, you can either say it out loud or type it in the chat. Communication, Asako, anybody else? The only thing that, I have a really country accent, sorry. But the only That's okay, thing I love I listening to of, you. The only thing I can think of, like the first thing that came to mind was just not toxic. <laughs> not toxic, that's great. That's great. I, I would say boundaries. 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 Okay, great. And um, all of them are definitely correct. But what we're going to talk about today, and I did not even tell Asako this beforehand, we are going to talk about communication. Um, there are so many aspects we can talk about when it comes to healthy relationships. So today we're gonna zero in on communication and you're gonna say, wow, or I hope you say, wow, I didn't realize communication could encompass this much. Um, so now we have another question, another participation question. How do we learn to communicate? And are we ever really formally taught to communicate? So how did you learn to communicate? I feel like we learn to communicate a lot through our parents. Like, I feel like that's a really big influence is how they communicate to people. Absolutely. Absolutely. Asako or Abby, any other ways? No, I, I totally agree with Caitlin. You know, we learn about how to communicate, you know, not just in relationships, but in, you know, with everybody in general, with those first um, relationships at home. Right. Um, Cause that's what you see when you're a kid. Um, but I also think, you know, we just learn by watching other people because your communication is going to be different. You know, I may communicate with, with uh, my supervisor than I differently than I communicate with my staff. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
Asako, any input on this? How, how do you think you learn to communicate? I think it's kind of like a trial, what is it, trial and error process yeah, too? Yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. Just yep. learning from the relationships you've been in in the past. Yeah, and there is no one right answer to this. So everything that you all said is correct. Um, so we definitely learn to communicate from that early age of, of, of kind of being taught to talk um, by our parents or siblings. And then what Abby said of, of watching, we watch those relationships. We watch our, our parents or parents or um, whoever's raising us and our siblings communicate and we mimic that communication as well. And definitely, I think um, Abby said this as well, that we communicate communicate differently in different relationships too. And um, we definitely have different styles of communication within the relationships. So, but just think about something that's so important and is the building block to a relationship. We are never taught. We go to school to learn all different kinds of other things, but never communication. You can take it in college, but you get, can kind of get through high school um, without really learning about communication. Okay. So today what I'm gonna do is I'm consulting the experts in my field. So um, just know these are the experts in my field of counseling. Um, I, I just kind of went with what I knew, went with um, what I have seen happen um, throughout people's lives as I counsel them. Um, so the experts in my field are John and Julie Gottman and they're actually a married couple and they have been study studying healthy relationships, communication and specifically marriages for over 40 years. And when I say studying, I mean putting people in rooms together and breaking down the micro ways that they communicate with one another. I'm actually gonna show you a few videos from them today because you can kind of say, aha, that's what they mean by this or aha, and put a, um, a face and a name to who they actually are. And if you were to ask anybody in probably the counseling or social work, um, sociology type of field, they would identify these two individuals as the leading experts. Um, anybody else probably came after them or learned from them. And they'll actually reference um, the people who have um, come after them in the videos that we watch today. Um, again, their main focus was married couples and um, that's because married couples spend the most time together, communicate the most, but you can take every single thing you're learning today and actually apply it to many different situations, especially work situations, um, like Abby mentioned, uh, partnerships or friendships too. So everything today can be applied. Okay. All right. Um, I went to find where I first found this at. I heard this um, in a continuing education class from the Gottmans. It was offered for free and I was so happy that I took it for free and I could not find the source of it. Um, but it was one of the most eye-opening things I have ever, ever heard about communication. Um, we always hear communicate in a healthy way or communicate uh, communication is better than no communication. We hear these really general things about communication, but we never break that down. So ga they gave this fantastic example. They gave a fantastic example of a man and a woman kind of in like a, a, a resort, a hotel room, and um, they were in there together. And person one, um, maybe the, the husband says, hey, honey, look outside at that boat. And that wife did not respond at all. What John and Julie Gottman said was, that is the worst thing, one of the worst things that somebody can do is put something out there and have it not be responded to at all. So I want you guys to weigh in right now. Have you ever done that? Whether that's a, um, I know Abby's married, a husband and wife situation or a work situation or a friendship, whether that's verbally or in a text message, have you ever put something out there and not got a response? I definitely have, like, especially lately. Yes. I've been having to email a lot of old professors because I'm applying to be a student ambassador and it's not like I'm like, hey, I really need this recommendation letter. I message and I'm like, hey, 
I kind of need a recommendation letter. If you don't want to send it, I completely understand. Have a great day. And everybody just ignores me. <laughs> and, and if you don't mind me sharing that or, or sharing a little bit more, Caitlin, how does that make you feel? When it makes don't... me feel like I don't matter. Like kinda, I'm just overlooked. Yeah. No response. I don't matter. I'm over. That's, ex- that's a great way to put it. I'm overlooked. That's fantastic. <clears throat> Asako or Abby, any examples of putting something out there and not having it heard? Um, I know just with my friends living all over the country and everything right now, like I have a friend who um, is currently driving like in a converted camper van with her husband all across the, the Southwest. And like, I'll text him and not hear back from them for days or a week or something. And it's kind of concerning because I don't know if they're safe or I don't know if they have sure. signal or what. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Asako, any examples that you want to provide? I think part of it is consistency too, right? Like I had a friend who I would text her and she would send me back like a page long text. And then she started sending really short ones. And I'm just like, oh, is everything okay? Like you know, makes you wonder what's going on. Could be something about me. could be something about her. Like, it's really hard to know, right? Right. You talk about it. Right. That's, you guys have provided fantastic examples all across, um, across the board. I'll give you an example. Um, I have been married, oh gosh, I lost count, 12 years, 12 years now. And I, and, and we have a child. And so that's one of the hardest things is to say, hey, and it can be something as small as, um, I'll use the classic example. Did you take out the trash today? And if my husband doesn't say yes or no, first of all, I don't know if that important thing has been done. And second of all, I don't know if I've been heard. Um, so there are so many examples across the board of it's not great if you don't respond. So think of that in your own life. And, and, and I know Abby, I've more than Asako, I've worked with Abby and Abby is fantastic at always responding or reaching out um, at both sides of it, reaching out and or responding. Um, so think of that in your own life. That can help you become a better communicator. Give some type of response. The next level that they observed, again, that man and woman are in a hotel room looking out and person one, that man might say, hey, honey, look at that boat outside. And the person two, the wife might say, huh, or oh, that's an okay, that's okay. One word is better than nothing, right? One word says that person heard you and that they acknowledge you. Do you guys have any examples of simple acknowledgements? Can be one word or simple acknowledgements that you can give. Maybe okay or thanks, like thank you, things like that. Yes, yeah. That's a great example, Caitlin. Yeah. Someone just saying, oh. Oh. Oh, Okay. Yeah. That could be many ways if you had it in a text even. Like, oh, is that a good O or a bad O? Mm -hmm. Yep. Asako, any examples? Um, I guess just like in text messages, like Abby was talking about, I think, um, yes. just like, you know, a thumbs up or, you know, smiley yes. face, like maybe someone's in a hurry, but they want to express that they got your message, you know? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Um, and I think to me, the biggest example that comes to my mind with kind of the one word answers is in work situations. I ever think I've had several bosses um, throughout this position and time at the college, and it's been consistent across the board that every single boss loved that if you would even just respond email received or thank you or okay. They loved that acknowledgement that they were heard and you were going to follow um, the order set for, forth. So one word better than no words, right? And then John and Julie Gottman um, saw this third level of communication. Person one, the husband might go to the window and outside say, hey, honey, look at that boat outside. Person number two, the wife might say, yes, I see it. It looks nice. And this is the best level of communication because it invites interactions. It begins a conversation. Um, They then kind of gave examples of them saying, oh, hey, maybe let's go outside and take a walk by the boats. Or um, did you know my dad had a boat? It invites interaction between people when somebody puts something out there and there's more than a one word response given, right? 
So on those three levels of communication, does anybody wanna weigh in with any thoughts about those three levels of communication so far? Any thoughts, any thoughts of um, never thought of it this way before, or um, this is so simple, it's great to bring it to light. Any thoughts on that? I think that um, sometimes, you know, just even a, a small acknowledgement that something was said is better than, you know, yeah. none, especially yes. when you're, you know, talking with somebody or in the same room as somebody. Yes. And we're gonna even break that um, non-acknowledgement down here a little bit further. Um, but this was the first way I was introduced to, to John and Julie Gottman. And I thought, how wonderful, this is so, you're breaking it down realistically of what's happening in communication. And then that communication can serve as a building block um, for the relationship. Okay, I'm gonna show a short video. Um, and this is actually John Gottman um, talking about how to build trust because that is a building block in a relationship too. The video goes on for a few minutes and I originally thought about cutting it off because he adds some kind of extra stuff, I guess I would say at the end. He adds some extra stuff at the end, um, but I think it's okay. I think it's important to hear and I think it's interesting. So I'll let the whole video play. Carissa, I'm not hearing a volume on it. Abby, can you say that again? You're not hearing it? Yeah, I'm not hearing it. When you did screen share, did you click the thing that said like share with sound? Make sure here. Try. Can you hear it now, Abby? Yep, that's got it. Thank you so much. Thank you. But how do you build trust? Again, you can turn to research because research is gonna tell you specifically what it is that increases this trust metric and what it is eventually that helps us understand the dynamics of betrayal. Okay, turns out that trust is built in very small moments, which I call sliding door moments, after the movie Sliding Doors, because in any interaction, there's a possibility of connection with our partner or turning away from our partner. Let me give you an example of that from my own relationship. So one night I was really wanting to finish a mystery novel. I, I thought I knew who the killer was, but I wanted to really find out. So I put the novel on my bedside and I walked in to the bathroom. And before I even got into the bathroom, I looked at my wife's face in the mirror and she looked sad. She's brushing her hair. So there was a sliding door moment. I had a choice. I could kind of sneak out of the <laughs> bathroom and think, you know, I don't want to deal with her sadness tonight. I don't want to read my novel. You know. Now that really wouldn't define our relationship any, you know, but <clears throat> because I'm a sensitive researcher of relationships, <laughs> I decided to go into the bathroom. I took the brush from her hair and I said, what's the matter, baby? She told me why she was sad. Now, that moment, I was building trust. I was there for her, right? I was connecting with her, rather than choosing to think only about what I wanted. These are the moments that we've discovered that build trust. Now, one such moment is not that important, but if you're always choosing to turn away, then trust erodes in the relationship very gradually, very slowly. And the next slide, you can see this idea of attunement is really the mechanism that my graduate student, Dan Yoshimoto, discovered is the basis for building trust. And attunement stands for this acronym of awareness of the other person's emotion, turning toward the emotion, tolerance of two different viewpoints, going for understanding the partner, 
responding non-defensively, and responding with empathy. The discovery in the research is that betrayal and distrust are not related to each other very strongly. In other words, betrayal is not the same as distrust. And we usually think of it as related, but the atom of betrayal is not just turning away, not just turning away from my wife's sadness in that moment, but doing what Carol Rusbolt called a CL alt, and you can see that on the third line. And what that means is I not only turn away from her sadness, but I think to myself, I can do better. Who needs this crap? I'm always dealing with her negativity. I can do better. Carol Rusbolt spent three decades studying this variable, CL alt. Because once you start, it stands for comparison level for alternatives. <clears throat> and once you start thinking that you can do better, then you begin a cascade of not committing to the relationship, of trashing your partner instead of cherishing your partner, of building resentment rather than gratitude, of lower investment in the relationship, less dependency for getting your needs met, not sacrificing for the relationship, and escalating conflict so it becomes an absorbing state. Okay, so we'll stop there with that one. Um, uh, pretty interesting to see him and hear him talk. He talks about it so simply and gently, right? I was going to um, originally share with you just the hairbrush example, but then I thought, you know what, Carissa, let that video go further. Let that video go further. Is there anything from that video that you can either relate to, identify with, or say, hey, this was important for me to hear? The attunement, like the acronym, I really yeah. like that. I even screenshotted it. Oh, cool. Okay. Awesome. I had, I had never heard of that before, and that was really interesting for me. Awesome. Awesome. I love it. I like the part. Um, it was interesting when he said that um, betrayal and trust don't have to go hand in hand. I thought that that was really neat and that they can stand independently from each other, too. Yeah, that was something that stood out to me as well. Yeah. Yeah. And really interesting to see where he said when relationships and specifically talking about um, marriages, partnerships here, that they go down here, Hill, the identifiable moment of, I think I can do better. There's an identifiable moment. Okay. All right, guys, I'm going to go on to the next slide. So what he is really talking about here and what the center of his research centers around are four things, four ways a relationship can break down. We've hit on some of them a little bit, but I'm going to um, break them down even further. The next four, four slides have a lot of information on them and I will read them, but we'll talk about them as well. So four ways a relationship can break down that have been observed over the last 40 years by the Gottmans are criticism within the relationship, defensiveness within the relationship, contempt within the relationship, and stonewalling. Can anybody take a guess before we begin those slides on what any of those mean? I feel like the stonewalling is kind of blocking people out and the contempt, that could be taken different ways because like Maybe it's like you were unfaithful to your partner or maybe you, like you were saying, like maybe they just didn't take out the trash for the 5,000th 5, 5, time. <laughs> sure, sure, yeah. I think criticism could be looking at, you know, um, just nitpicking could start yes. as, as nitpicking and then moving on to, you know, kind of bigger things, you know, um, you know, it could be like, I'm just thinking, you know, in, in examples of relationships, marriage, um, criticize, criticizing food, you know, how something is cooked, sure. or, um, the way somebody does a chore or doesn't do a chore. Um, Absolutely. And then just builds from there. Absolutely. Also it has to do with the way you interpret things that are coming into you. Mm -hmm. 
And Asako, exactly what you're saying is gonna play into the defense card here too. So that was really good to point out. Yeah, okay. Again, there's a lot on the next four slides, but I thought it was pretty important and I didn't find any other way that I could have um, broken it down to, to, to make as much sense. So we're gonna start with criticism. When you criticize your partner, you're basically implying that there's something wrong with them. Like Abby said, that dinner wasn't cooked the way I like it, or you burnt dinner again. So you're saying, you can't cook. You are not a good cook. What else can you not do by saying that? You have taken a problem between you and put it inside of your partner's body using the words like you always or you never are common ways that criticism happens. When you criticize, your partner is most likely to feel under attack and then respond defensively. And that'll be on the next slide. Criticism is so dangerous. It's a dangerous pattern to get into because neither person feels heard and both may begin to feel bad about themselves in the presence of one another. So what do we do? What is the antidote to it? It's to make a direct complaint that's not a global attack on your partner or your partner's personality. So instead of criticizing like, you are the worst cook or you always burn dinner, something like, that dinner wasn't my favorite, maybe we should try this next time, or um, I'm not a fan of that, can we try this? Um, instead of really placing that blame on the other person. And you can definitely see this in work relationships too. You could see it where somebody would say, so-and-so never X, Y, and Z, or so-and-so always, um, instead of saying, hey, this is the issue we have between us or within our department, how can we fix it? So when you place blame on somebody else. Now that we've talked about criticism, does anybody have any other examples they wanna add of, of criticism? I know like whenever my husband and I are having a, a disagreement about something, we always try to, you know, not that it's fighting, but we try to fight fair and yeah. make it, you know, if we're going to say something, make it about a situation or a thing, not about the person. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you often hear that term fair fighting, but when you break that term fair fighting down, what does it mean? And it means everything, the next four things that we're going to talk about. Great example. All right, the next one is defense. Okay. When you attempt to defend yourself from a perceived attack, so maybe the partner criticizes, you're, you're, you want to defend. Defense can be a counter complaint um, against them. Another way to be defensive is to not take any blame. Unfortunately, defensiveness keeps partners from taking responsibility for problems. And what it does is it escalates negative communication. And this one I think is so, so, so hard out of all of them that we're gonna talk, talk about today. I think for, for me personally, I think this one is so, so hard. Even if your partner is criticizing you, defensiveness is not the way to go. It only fuels the bad exchange. So even if one person is saying, you really cooked dinner badly, you are not good at this, da, 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 instead of putting up those walls and being defensive, all that does is it continues to build and escalate the situation on top of one another. So the antidote to defensiveness is to try and hear your partner's complaint. And this is the hard one. This is the, the like the really, really hard one. And to try and take even some, a tiny bit of the responsibility. So even just the way, way I talk about this, you all can tell that this is, this is probably my hardest, hardest point um, is defensiveness. Any other examples of defensiveness? No. Go ahead, Asako, great. Oh, I, was gonna say, I don't know if this counts as defensiveness, but like when you say something to someone and they're like, oh, I'm sorry you feel that way. Yes, yes. I, I have a friend who, a great friend who often does that. And I wonder why, um, wonder why she does that. I'm sorry you feel that way. Or you could just simply leave it as I'm sorry. And that would be non-defensive. 
so a situation happened, just, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that. Or I'm sorry you feel that way, puts it back on that person. And it doesn't take any responsibility. What a great example. Yeah, okay. So here's the third one. This is kind of the, oh, I don't like this one. This is the not great one. Contempt. Contempt is any statement or nonverbal behavior that puts yourself on a higher ground. And of course, this talks about the partner, but again, work relationships or friendships. When you're kind of saying, huh, I'm better than that person. This includes mocking the partner, calling them names, rolling eyes, sneering and disgust. So all of those like, ugh, disgusted kind of faces, shaking the head, things like that that happen, happens. John and Julie Gottman say, contempt is the most serious out of the four that we're talking about right now. This is almost an attack. Contempt is an attack, right? Um, the antidote to contempt is to lower your tolerance for contemptuous statements and then actively work on building a culture of appreciation. So um, the best, I guess, defense for this one or the best way for this one is to head it off before it even starts. Caitlin, you agree that contempt is the most serious. Want to weigh in on that? I would say that it's just the most serious because like you're, you're making like in like a married or like boyfriend, girlfriend perspective, you're making your partner feel like they're less than you and that they're not deserving of the same things that you are. And like, I don't think you should do that to anyone. That's just not going to no. set a good foundation for the future. No, it does not set a good foundation for the future. And, and this is kind of like the identifier of, aha, the relationship is at the end. And that could be a friendship too, when contemptuous things start happening, happening in the relationship. Um, I didn't mention yet, but John and Julie Gottman study couples so much that they can predict with over 90% accuracy, I think it's even higher than 90%, out of all the couples they studied, who would stay together and who wouldn't just based on watching them communicate, right? So then when you hear that, man, 90% prediction out of, out of these things we're learning about today, predict a healthy, ultimately a healthy relationship. Is this relationship going to work? Is it going to last? And that's if we're looking at healthy relationship in the terms of a long lasting loving relationship. Um, but 90, over 90% 90 accuracy of looking at these things and whether these things are in place or not, whether they're good or bad, and if that relationship will last. So really communication, building blocks of the relationship. Um, the last one we're going to do, I want to apologize um, to, 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 to anybody who watches this um, who is a male, um, but in general, this trait happens more for males than females, um, and it's stonewalling. Stonewalling happens when a listener withdraws from the conversation. The stonewaller might actually physically leave the room or just stop talking in the conversation. What happens is they appear to shut down. The stonewaller may look like he doesn't care. And again, they're using he because when they study this, 80% are men, but it's usually not the case. Typically the stonewaller is overwhelmed and they're trying to calm themselves. Unfortunately, this seldom works because the partner, especially if it's a woman, is likely to assume they don't care enough about the problem to talk about it. It can be a vicious circle with one person, person demanding to talk and the other person looking for escape. So the antidote to this, I think has been mentioned along the way so far today, especially when Abby talks about fair fighting, is agreeing to taking a break. So now we all have a term, right? For what that husband, boyfriend, father, male or, or females in our life do when they just walk away from a situation. It's called stonewalling. It's not a great sounding term, but what it means is they need to calm down. They need to turn over the situation in their mind and they need to reassess. And we as, as women, I'm, I'm, I'm being general here, um, want to talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and then have a resolution. Um, 
but that's what stonewalling is. Does anybody want to weigh in and say like, aha, stonewalling a term. I've experienced this. Has anybody experienced? Go ahead, Caitlin. Yeah, I, I feel like I've definitely experienced this. And I feel like I've also probably did this a couple of times. Like recently, yeah. I'm okay. Like I'm obviously fine. But I was in a car wreck. It was nothing major. And the, for the first like two minutes, I just screamed at the top of my lungs. Like I could not stop screaming. I was so scared. My car was absolutely totaled. And then after that, like, I just couldn't talk. Like, I was in such shock. Everybody's asking me questions, and everybody's like, what did you do? What happened? And I just sat there. Like, I couldn't talk to no one for at least 10 minutes, and I feel like that's what I did. Sure, sure, sure. You were overwhelmed, and now think that, that some people may feel this same feeling of overwhelming when they're trying to communicate effectively. Their brains are just overwhelmed. Yeah, definitely. And this relates to that, think back about that tiny example we did, that tiny example in the beginning of standing at the window saying, honey, look at this boat and no response. That, that's, that's stonewalling too, There's no, when there's no response, stonewalling. Abby, did you want to weigh in? I saw your mic go off a minute ago. Yeah, yeah. I just think, you know, stonewalling might be what people resort to when they don't know, when they don't have the communication skills to respond. They, right. They've never maybe seen good communication modeled, so they don't know how to, um, you know, communicate. Right. right, and that definitely relates back to that we're never taught to communicate and we watch our parents um, or we watch our families and we just, we just um, uh, resemble that. Asako, go ahead. Yeah, I think also it has to do with gender stereotypes, right? Or sure. gender expectations that men are not really taught to talk about their feelings as much. Yeah, so absolutely. Have something to do with it too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yep. Okay. All right. So I have another short video. This is Julie this time talking. Um, I wanted you to see both of them talking because uh, they're both pretty interesting. So I'm going to go ahead and play Julie's video, How to Complain Without Hurting Your Partner. So everything we just uh, uh, talked about put into perspective. When we studied how couples brought up problems, you know, on videotape, these 3,000 couples, what we saw was that they followed basically three rules, three typical behaviors for couples who made it work, who made lasting relationships. Here's what they did. Step one, they always started with I. And it was usually I'm upset or I'm worried, or I'm angry. So it was I plus some kind of feeling. And, you know, if they didn't know, you know, if they didn't know from feelings, what feeling is what feel, which one, they just say I'm upset. Because again, as I mentioned earlier, upset covers everything. So they'd say I'm upset. And then about what? Step two is about what? And the about what part was really interesting because they wouldn't say, I'm upset that you're such an idiot. They wouldn't do that. They wouldn't go blaming, right? They would say something that was, again, more factual. They'd talk about the facts. I'm upset that the garbage hasn't been taken out. I'm angry that there's a new dent in the car. I'm furious. So they could be angry. Anger was okay. I'm furious that the bills haven't been paid. Okay? So they were not describing their partner. They were describing themselves and then describing the situation that they were upset about. That's, that was the trick. And finally, the third step is that they would say what they needed. How could their partner make it better? How could their partner shine for them? So they said what they needed. I need you to take out the garbage. I need you to drive more carefully so our car will be protected. So they would say what they needed. And I know that that's something that's really, really hard for us, especially in this culture 
because after all we're all individuals we're all self-sufficient we don't need anybody from any you know nothing we need nothing right ha 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 we are all pack animals as little human beings and we do need each other that's the reality we die if we don't have connection with other people you take infants and isolate them they die you can give them all the food and water they need they will die we need touch we need connection we need each other that's just the reality there's no such thing as too needy no such thing everybody has needs that's who we are that's how we're built when okay guys um let's talk a little bit about that um what she's breaking down there is she's talking about in counseling we call it an i message um has anybody ever heard of sending or an i message before yes Abby. It's, it's probably also because i took counseling classes too yep yep <laughs> yep yep but isn't it great to hear her describe it in that way it, not it really it, is it's um, not so cut and dry no it's not it's not and it's you know kind of identifying those statements where you think you're making the correct statement but you're still um the way that it's coming across is still putting it back on someone else absolutely absolutely caitlin have you ever used an i message whether you knew you were doing it or not before yeah all the time like i have a boyfriend and i'll say things like it can be really silly like i'm hungry or it can be serious yeah. to the point of like i'm upset we need to work on this more you know what i mean and i love it that you and um julie gottman both said they can include feelings and i loved it when she gave that example of i'm furious so it can include feelings too okay um i see we're at 12 48 and i have a few more slides left um 12 48 on my computer oh i went backwards i need to go forwards okay all right oops sorry abby i accidentally asked you to unmute but that's okay i was just moving stuff around on my screen um so kind of as we wrap up today um, and we kind of integrated everything as, as we talked, we integrated a lot of things, whether that's learning about people who are unhealthy with us or whether it's learning about our unhealthy behavior patterns. So here are some skills for active listening, because this communication boils down to let's listen to one another, let's talk to one another, let's have conversations. In some of these things you're going to say, you might say, this is so true, I should be doing this, or this is so true. Why doesn't everybody do this? So he breaks it down into 10 things that we all can do to be active listeners and in return, build these healthy relationships, healthy friendships, healthy partnerships. All of this, what I'm saying, can be put into working relationships as well, work relationships as well. So the first thing is focus on being interested, not interesting. So sit there and absorb what somebody else is saying. Nod your head, say those one word answers or those multiple word answers or return their comment. Focus on being interested. How you can do that is you can start by asking questions. Um, I think we've exhibited some really, really good, healthy communication in this workshop today. And there were questions asked. Caitlin would ask a question, I would ask a question. We can ask questions when we're active listening. Look for common ground. This is always helpful in any situation, looking for common ground. Four is very, very, very hard to do. Um, tune in with all of your attention. Put your cell phone down. Asako did something amazing. She said uh, before this started, I'm going to put my phone on silent before we began. And that's just that's really cool to hear being on the other end. I'm tuning in with all my attention. Communicate your listening with a nod or a sound. Uh-huh, yeah, great. You can paraphrase what the speaker says, like, oh yeah, um, <clears throat> Abby, I heard that you say this happened with your spouse. You can communicate that by paraphrasing. Validate emotions. 
Um, this is easier for some people than, enough, than other people's uh, to do, to validate emotions. And Asako gave example of this when she said that somebody said, um, I'm sorry that you're feeling that way. They weren't taking any responsibility, um, but just validating emotions like, I'm sorry that happened, that is validating as well. Eye contact is definitely important. Um, actually, when, when Julie Gottman was talking about failure to thrive in infants, that is actually one thing that an infant needs to survive. An infant needs to build up their healthy hormones. And this is why, um, I'll break it down even a little more, uh, breastfeeding is, is, uh, is good and recommended. Um, and if you can't, is their face is so close to your face, looking into their eyes. Eye contact is so important because it creates um, oxytocin and love hormones and chemicals in our body that connect us with one another. And it all starts, you know, with, with infants. Um, let go of your own agenda when talking and then turning off the TV. We can have turning off the TV slash computer slash iPhone there. So those are their skills that they list for active listening. Is there anyone that you would like to think and pick uh, uh, that you would like to do better? So out of those 10, is there anyone that you would say, I think this is the one that speaks to me that I think I can be doing better in my own relationships? For me, it's definitely the eye contact. Like I have such a hard, I'm doing that for some reason. I cannot look at anyone in their eyes. Like I guess it's just a natural thing. I've did it since I was little. I have just the tendency to look down when I talk to people. Sure. And it's not like I'm afraid or anything. It's just I feel comfortable with that. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I creepy to just stare at you right in the eyes. <laughs> and that's that's hard. It's really, really hard to do. Yeah. Abby or Asako, is there any on there that, that speak to you? paraphrasing what the speaker says sometimes I feel a little silly doing it but um it's definitely worth trying to do more and I have listened to um counseling I I, I listen to counseling tapes of, of counselors and training and there can be whole counseling sessions just based off of paraphrasing so literally whole conversations for an hour can happen and things can happen just by paraphrasing so you're right Asako it does feel silly but it can really take you places Abby is there any on there yeah I would say you know letting go of you know your own agenda is one that I could work on more especially in my relationship um you know, I'm, I can be kind of stubborn and, and think, you know, well, this is obviously the better way to be doing this. Um, sure. you know, but I need to let my husband also, you know, put his plans or, or try it his way to, um, you know, that can be, you know, people say, oh, happy wife, happy life, but it's, it's, you know, you have to have both people in it because both people are part of that relationship. Absolutely. And that's the one that I also identify with the most because I am a, um, on a personality scale, when you're talking about personalities, I am, everything has a place, every place has a thing, do a checklist, cross things off the list, get it done. I love that. I love crossing stuff off lists and having planners. And Abby, I know you love your new year planner too, right? The Absolutely. The plan. I love I the planner. planner. Got to have my lists. That's yes. what I do. Yes, I, I do that as well. And with that, that creates my own agenda where somebody might come in with something so important or a situation that needs handled right away or, or something that needs to be talked about or an immediate counseling session or a concern from my husband or my child. And I have to say, okay, this doesn't have to get done right now. Or like you were saying, Abby, with my kid, I can say, okay, it can, can be done a million different ways. So letting go of my own agenda is something I, I definitely um, recognize. And I saw that we had somebody else joining us and I think your name is pronounced Nai. So Nai, thank you for joining us. Um, we're at the end and Asako is recording this um, right now. And I think I have about one or two more slides left for everybody as our time is um, getting near the end. Okay. I have one, one more brief video. I think it's about two minutes. And I thought, let's just end on a happy note. Let's just end on a high note. 
I was searching through all kinds of videos um, with these guys, John and Julie Gottman, and I liked this one and I thought, why not? Let's add this at the end here. So I will play this and then I think we have one more slide. I was uh, publishing my book, The Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work, and I went to uh, Crown, the publisher, and I tried to convince them to put a lot of money into advertising this book. And I talked to their staff, and the guy who was head of marketing was very skeptical. And I was just not winning this guy over. And finally, he, uh, he spoke up and he said, look, tell me one thing I can do in 30 seconds to improve my marriage. And I said, well, the book really has a lot of things, but if I was going to pick one thing, it'd be honor your wife's dreams. And the guy stood up and walked out of the room. You know, I thought, well, that didn't go very well. But it turned out he actually was stunned by my answer because he had, didn't have a clue what his wife's dreams were. And he went home. He left the office and took a subway to Brooklyn where he lived and walked in on his wife. And his wife said, did you get fired? Uh, you know, this guy was a really sort of strong per personality. And he, he said, no. And he said, I had this guy over there. You know, he studies marriage. And I want to know, what are your dreams? And she she looked at him and she said, I thought you'd never ask. And they had this great conversation and he got behind advertising the book. So I found that when we were, uh, when I was preparing for this workshop and I thought, how neat is that? Because that can apply to any situation. And when I apply that to my own life and, and even looking at um, working relationships, um, that can go, go for husband and wife. But when I apply that to my own life, I think about um, my boss, Brittany and I, um, sometimes you know, we, we might be communicating via text. And one of our uh, texts more recently, I had talked about the percentage of people I met with in, in counseling last semester. I said something like 48% of all my time was spent one-on-one -on -one with students in counseling sessions. And I said, I would love to make that, um, you know, over 50% next semester. And she said something like, what can I do to help you make that happen? Um, and that was really cool because that's honoring my dreams, my role as a counselor. Have you guys ever been in situations like that where you felt really hurt and you felt like your dreams um, and what you wanted to grow was going to happen, whether that was with a spouse, a boyfriend, somebody at work, a mom, a dad? I mean, I felt like um, for me, you know, especially when we started working from home, you know, our setup at home was not really ideal for how I needed to do my job. I was, you know, our computer was set up in our living room, which meant I was spending 16 hours a day in the same room. Um, and it just felt like, um, it felt like I couldn't escape, you know, it felt yeah. like I couldn't just leave work. Um, so after we'd been in this, you know, work from home status for so long, you know, we, sorry, that's my dog. Um, we'd started in March, um, around July, August of that time. Um, I, you know, talked with my husband and I said, Hey, can we make your painting studio kind of a better setup for both of us? Something that's more efficient for both of us. And he heard me, he let me work out my whole plan and everything. And he was on board with, with what I wanted to do and what I wanted to see to make the space functional for both of us. And it has been, you know, since he let me kind of make my vision come to fruition, um, it's been a much more productive space for both of us for anything that we want to do. And we end up spending more time together you know, on weekends or things like that, if we're both in here um, doing work or just being on the computer and things like that. And, and that was probably, you know, when we talk about building blocks of a relationship and healthy relationships, that probably just wasn't, you know, a small stone or a small brick. That was probably a big thing that helped um, your relationship, Abby. Yes. And it, because, you know, there was a significant cost involved to getting things set up, you know, buying desks and bookcases and um, getting me set up with different equipment um, and just making it kind of my vision, but it showed me that he respected me and wanted me to feel successful in my job um, and wanted to help support me in that. Uh, as you were talking, that that gave me a 
um, an, an example it came to my mind. My husband and I, we went to Ireland. Uh, we saved for a while. We went to Ireland, one of the biggest trips ever that we took. And when you go to Ireland, sometimes you'll do Northern Ireland or Southern Ireland. And we did, you know, Southern Ireland as our trip, but there was a place I really, really wanted to go to in Northern Ireland called Giant's Causeway. And I just couldn't get it out of my mind. And it has these hexagon, hexagon shaped rocks and it just looks cool. And as we were planning the trip, my husband did most of the planning. He said, um, you know, where do you want to go? And I said, I want to go there. I know it's in Northern Ireland. And he looked some stuff up and we were able to set a whole day aside, do like a little van day from where we were staying in Southern Ireland and took a whole day up there to go see um, Giant's Causeway. And thinking back, it's something I'm so thankful that I got to do um, because it made it just not feel like his trip, but mine too. And it's probably one of my favorite places that I've ever visited. So Abby, talking about your own marriage and something that your husband did that was helpful um, and cool and neat in a relationship builder. I think that was um, cool and neat in a relationship builder and mine too. So um, Caitlin, do you have an example of sometimes somebody honored your dreams? And it can be a mom or dad too. Um, for me, I guess it would be my grandma. My grandma, she unfortunately passed away a couple years ago, but when she was alive, she was probably my number one supporter because I, I eventually want to be a lawyer, and I know that that's a really, really hard goal to achieve, and I figured that out at a young age. Of, I know I want to do this. I feel like I can be good at this, and she has been the person in my life to like constantly until she passed away, she constantly supported me and let me know that like I could do that because all of my family has only got associate's degrees. I would be the first one to go anywhere past an associate's degree and like everybody else is kind of like, well, you just need to get an associate's degree, stay with that. And my grandma was like, no, you can be a lawyer. You need to stay on top of that. And that was really helpful because even though she's passed away now, like it's still kind of a reminder. You know what I mean? Absolutely. So she honored your dreams all the time. Yeah, for Absolutely. sure. Absolutely. And I know we have about one minute left. Asako, do you want to weigh in? And then I will share the final slide that you sent me. Sure. Um, I think also just my family trying to support me through higher education, like, um, you know, coming to my graduation and everything like that. I think they really supported me that way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so really celebrating you too. That's a good relationship builder is celebrating with people. So celebrating. All right. Um, Asako asked me to share this last slide. Thank you for attending. Um, please fill out the survey. She put a QR code on there to win a prize. Asako, do you want to say anything about this final slide? No, oh, just thanks for coming. And um, if you can fill it out, that would be great. Um, and I hope that you can uh, attend our events in the future as well. We have our next one up is um, on home repair in two weeks. And I just want to thank, I didn't get to thank Osako and Abby for inviting me right away at the beginning. So thank you. Thank you, thank you guys so much. This was really helpful and I look forward to the next one. Oh, great. Thank you, Caitlin. Yeah. Bye, Caitlin. Thanks, Caitlin. Bye, guys. Bye. 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 See you then.